Tick tock, time to rock. I believe that we are live. Those of you who watch know, I usually wait until I see myself so that I know that we are moving. All right, there's me. There's Mark. We're here. All right, so good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the atheists, the agnostics, and yes, all you black Hebrew Israelites who are watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me is the man who's been described as one of the greatest Christians in the world, Mark Middleberg. Mark Middleberg, is that true? <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's true or not. That is exactly uh, what I would expect. That is, that is exactly <laughs> what I would expect someone who could be one of the greatest Christians in the world to say. You can't just say yes, right? Of course not. <laughs> All yeah, right. I'm I'm seeing myself with a delay. Am I okay? Or you you hear me? Oh okay? yeah 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 yeah. See, you're talk you're talking to me through Skype, and then it's and then it's going to YouTube. So there's there should be about a twenty to twenty five second delay. So whatever you're seeing on the screen, that's about twenty to twenty five seconds behind us talking on Skype. Got that? All right. All right. So, um, all right. I'm here with Mark Middleberg, and f for some of you who you know watch my stuff or you know, criticism of Islam and things like that. Uh, if you're not interested in, uh, uh, you know, standard apologetics and stuff like that, you might not know who Mark Middleberg is. Um, but hopefully, if you were just watching uh, the uh, premiere of that uh, that that talk with the Beal, you saw Mark there. I did want to uh, I did want to read Mark uh, from the Beal's from the Beal's little uh, acknowledgments here at the beginning of seeking Allah, finding Jesus for so that people would have an idea. Um, so Nabil has his acknowledgments at the beginning of Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And if you've got it, you can look there, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Nabil said, If there is one person without whom this book would not have been written, it is Mark Middleberg. From the very first stage of suggesting the book, to finding an agent, to choosing a publisher, to helping me write the book, to contributing to the book, to marketing the book, I am left wondering how much of the book is actually mine. Mark, your consummate mentorship and friendship is inspiring and compels me to be the best I can be. I will never be able to thank you enough. So that's that's what Nabil thought of Mark Middleberg, everyone. And uh, Mark, what did you think of Nabil? Uh, well, first of all, I was blown away when I read that and just so honored. And I just have to say, it's one of the great privileges of my life to be close friends with Nabil. Uh, you know, I met him pretty quickly after he'd come to faith. It was, it's been a few years, but he was pretty early on. And so to have that kind of friendship and, you know, he would sometimes call me one of his mentors and to be able to build into him and then to see what he would do with it. Because mm -hmm. I mean, this is a student that would quickly learn whatever you shared with him and then learn more and then come back and share it with you, right? I mm -hmm. mean, he just brilliant hungry for truth, hungry to know God, uh, passionate for Christ and the gospel. And so, you know, it, like I say, just a great privilege to know him, to be friends for about 10 years. And as you know, David, it was a lot of fun, too, because he, he loved to laugh. He, he loved to joke, as you saw in the video that we just watched. Uh, he loved good food. He loved to uh, goof around, and he loved Jesus. So, I mean, it, just a delightful combination of character traits in that one young man. Uh, you mentioned good food, and that's actually, uh, since we're talking about, talking about Nabil, and this was his birthday, I'll share a quick birthday story. Uh, by the way, uh, Mark can't stay terribly long, everyone. He has deadlines for things, so um, Mark, whenever you actually need to go, just give me a signal. Go like this, go, caca, caca, and that'll be, <laughs> that'll be a clue Look to me. Here. That'll be a clue to me that, that, uh, <laughs> That uh, that we need to that, that we need to wrap it up with you, um, and I'll probably stay on Good. a little afterwards and stuff. But um, uh, speaking of food, um, here's a birthday story. This was like I don't know, 2000, maybe 2007, and could have been 2008. But Nabil and I were in California, and it was his birthday, and we just had a a rule all along that whoever's birthday it was got to pick what you know we were going to eat that day, which is a Good rule. That should be a rule for everyone. But Nabil wanted sushi. 
And I'd only had sushi once. It was when I was a little kid and it was at like the worst Chinese buffet in the world. And it was this nasty sushi and I ate it and it was completely disgusting. So when he said, let's go eat sushi, I was thinking that. And so I had, I was driving the rental car and I said, no, I'm not going. And he said, what? It's, it's my birthday. I get to decide. I said, I don't care. Then pick something that we both like. I'm not eating something that's, that's, that's that horribly disgusting. So he threw like a tantrum for the next half hour. And finally we agreed to like go eat Italian or something like that. Uh, but he stayed mad about that for like two years. Every time I, every time we would bring something up and I said, Hey, I want to go do this. He would go, Oh, like the time I wanted sushi on my birthday and you wouldn't let me have it. <laughs> so it was like two, it was like two or three years later when he was still complaining about that, whenever I would bring up something that I wanted. And so fi finally I said, fine, let's go eat sushi. And so we went and ate sushi and they, they brought out this awesome, delicious stuff. And then I found out I really, really like sushi. And so, uh, so ever since then, I've really loved sushi. It's like on, on my favorite. It's like steak and then sushi. And uh, so anyway, so he uh, he kind of converted you then too. Huh? He he converted me. He converted me. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So, I, so know, he like he could he converted to Christianity. I converted to to sushiism. It's a great exchange. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I like sushi too. I like it grilled. Um, I should also <laughs> add that. Uh, I'm sitting here in my kitchen, uh, or on the edge of my kitchen, and I have great memories. Nabil, when he was here, I live in Colorado, and uh, he would often come and speak at Summit Ministries. We both teach with them uh, down in Manitou Springs, uh, and he would do a variety of things we'd bring him in for. But he would stay at the house here, and we would hang out and uh, always enjoy good meals. Uh, Heidi would make great stuff. But one night, uh, and I know you've heard the story, David, but one night uh, Nabil said, I'm going to make the meal tonight. I'm going to use my secret recipe. And we go, okay, cool. What is it? And he said, you got to get some good prime rib steak. Uh, you know, steak, and we're going to do this thing. And he had this potion he did to it and all the you know recipe. But part of the process was, I think I think he did, you probably know this recipe, he I think he did it a little bit on the cast iron skillet a little, but then the key was you put the oven on broil yeah. and put it in the oven. And, uh, you know, it's very close to the heat and, uh, you know, 500 degrees or whatever. Yeah. So hey, we hey, did hey look, look, quick, quick, quick side note. I think I may be the only one who knows Nabil's steak recipe because he showed me. I may, maybe I'll make a video one day and say this is how Nabil made uh the awesomest steaks anyone's ever had but yeah he was he, was, he would pan sear them he would pan sear the, the them on top and then stick them in the broiler but just wanted everyone to know that remind me later ladies and gentlemen to to come out with that story but, but go ahead yeah i just got to finish the story because oh, no. they awesome if they don't start on fire like they did for us um and they still turned out pretty pretty good but uh yeah he uh almost burned down our whole house because the uh all of a sudden our, fi our oven's on fire because he's you know, broiling these very, you know, fat marbled steaks very close to the flame. And uh, it was it was quite an adventure, but a great memory I have now of the BO almost burning my kitchen down. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, one quick comment here from a troublemaker who said, but was he a doofus? He's talking about you. Um, when the people was talking uh, about you, he says, but was he a doofus? Um, because You're the only person he ever called a doofus. Yeah. And I keep telling people and they never listen that it's not doofus. It's an Urdu word, doofus, which means, uh, kind of a mentor. Um, but like in a, an extreme version of a mentor, it's like, you know, as an example, like what Yoda was in star Wars, that would, in, in Urdu, they would have called him doofus. So just so everyone knows what Nabil meant by calling me, uh, that. I would, I would like to see the original sources on that one, David. Well, uh, well, all the, all the Urdu speakers here can uh, can vouch for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, 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 uh, now, Mark, you're you're one of the people who uh, who, uh, a, a, as Nabil pointed out, that uh, you were the one suggesting that he write a book and and helped him set that up, and then helped him to through the writing process and things like that. But uh, even before that, it was it was several years before that that. You were with some Christian TV station. You had me and Nabil come out and uh, and speak. So, do you remember? Do you remember how you even heard about Nabil? Because that that was that was yeah. that was early on. He had he hadn't he hadn't been a Christian for terribly long. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that was uh, Church Communication Network. It no longer is in existence, but uh, they are actually kind of replaced by the 
uh, Insight Media people that hosted the uh, broadcast we just watched. But yeah, here's the story real quick. How I met Nabil is uh, I'm friends with Mike Lacona. Mm. And uh, Mike's a good buddy, and I had taught with him here and there. And he started telling me about this friend of his. In, in fact, a little backstory: I had done one of those TCM broadcasts with, uh, I, I don't think Lee Strobel was part of that one, but it was on mm. Islam. And Michael Kona found out about it and invited his Muslim friend, Nabil. So the first time mm. Nabil heard me teach, he was still a Muslim. Oh, wow. And it was a broadcast we did, yeah. But anyway, Nabil told, excuse me, David told me about Nabil and said, you just got to meet this guy sometime and his crazy friend, the guy named David Wood, uh, who's, a, he said he's, he's a little, a little edgy, but he's a genius. So you got to meet this guy. I thought, sounds like my kind of friend. Um, so I was speaking at a conference in Virginia and found out Nabil was going to be there and Mike Lacona gave me the number. I, uh, actually emailed Nabil. I said, Hey, I'd love to meet you. He set up a lunch. And what a what a lunch meeting because Nabil was there, his girlfriend at the time, Michelle, who mm-hmm. later became his wife, was there. Uh, Mary Jo Sharp was there. I had never met Mary Jo, and I think there were a couple other people. And you were there, mm-hmm. and so I met all these people who are now good friends uh, all at once at mm-hmm. that uh, meal before a conference in Virginia, and that was just the beginning of a long friendship. And uh, we have so many stories and so many things <laughs> we did. But, uh, great memory. Yeah, uh, I want to. I want to have. Uh, I want to have Michelle on for a for a live stream. One. I want to find out if she remembers when we first met because uh, uh, me and her and Nabil went out for ice cream at Cold Stone, and lots of people when they meet someone new, they're like on their best behavior. But I try to do something silly and ridiculous so they know what to to expect later. And uh, I think that is your best behavior, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, um, <laughs> so Nabil was getting his ice cream and her ice cream, and he got her ice cream and he handed it to me, and I already had my ice cream. And so he said, he told me to hold his while he goes and gets hers. So I was holding mine and his, and then he walked away to get hers. And I turn and look, and, and, and she looked over at me, and I had Nabil's ice cream in my hand, and I go, <laughs> and then I handed it back to Nabil when he, when he came over. And so, uh, anyway, um, anyway, did now, she that, tell him? No, why? <laughs> so, um, That's great. I, I want to hear that uh, dialogue between you and Michelle. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so Mark, um, there, is, there is an issue that I'd like to get to because uh, I saw it. I, I mean, I've seen it come up tons and tons of times since Nabil passed away. And even during the live stream, the people who were who were in the chat, there were lots of people just going, "Why? You know, why? Why did this guy? Um, why did this guy die?" Um, and if, you know, if we think about the question, um, you know, it's uh, when I think about what Nabil had done in such a short such a short period of time. Um, you know, yeah. multiple degrees, uh, was working on his second doctorate, multiple master's degrees, um, three books. He was already working on two more books, and then cancer. And he's Thirty-four years old. Yeah, and then cancer diagnosis, and uh, yeah. um, lots of people were praying for him. Tons of people, people all over the world, were praying for him, and then um, it, the, the, they didn't get what they prayed for. Um, so I didn't want to turn in such a you know I didn't wanted to keep it fun, didn't want to turn in such a dark dark direction so quickly. But uh, given the number of people who were um, who were mentioning that in the chat, uh, I did want to get your thoughts on that while you're here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an important question. It's a hard one. Um, in fact, I think it's worth pointing out that that broadcast we did was in the fall of 2014. The book had come out just a few months earlier. And it was less than, if I have my math right here, it was less than two years after that that he was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer and then he died 13 months after that so i mean uh it's just the the, the shortness of that time scale is just breathtaking um you know there's part of me that just has to say uh you know what a friend of mine cliff connectly who's a university evangelist to this question he says i have a four-part answer or word answer actually he says i do not know mm-hmm. and I just have to be honest and say that, you know, 
bad things do happen to good people in this world and sometimes to the best people. Um, I had a similar question when I was a young Christian and I was a huge fan and follower of a guy who wasn't just a musician. He was almost like a prophet Mm -hmm. to our generation. That was Keith Green. And similar deal. I mean, he died, I think he was only like 28, died in a plane crash. And it's like, God, this makes no sense. I mean, this this guy was a weapon for Mm -hmm. you. And this guy was lethal. And Nabil, I mean, just his mix of intellect and winsomeness and communication and writing abilities and um, and, and personality and love. I mean, I, I, it's funny. I read his book, and I learned a lot about Islam, but more than that, I loved his family by the, yep. by the end of the book. And I loved Muslims. I, 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 you know, It's not a book of hate or a book against Muslims. It's a book of love for Muslims, trying to give them the best news possible, and that is that there is a Savior who paid for all of our sins. And so, again, it, that all culminates to say, why God? And I just don't know that we're going to have a good answer uh, this side of heaven, though I will quickly add, I think the alternatives, you know, if you you say, okay, well, therefore I can't trust the God of the Bible or I can't be a Christian because people like Nabil die and it doesn't make sense, I have to quickly ask, what's the alternative? I Mm -hmm. mean, you know, you jump to an atheistic position, uh, we're just, you know, uh, what did Richard Dawkins say? We're just, you know, there is no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. There's no, you know, this isn't an exact quote, but basically there, we live in a universe of blind, pitiless indifference. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, bad things happen. Get over it. I mean, survival of the fittest, the deal wasn't evidently fit enough. Or, I mean, I cringe even talking that way, but, but in atheism, where we are not special creations made in the image of a holy God, a Father who loves us, it's just, you know, we're all going to die. The universe is going to die in a heat death. And, you know, it, none of it has any meaning. None of it has any purpose. And I think you hear all that and you go, but wait, no, wait a minute. Mm. I know my life has meaning mm-hmm. and I, I sense purpose. And I look at a young man like Nabil and I believe that he had great, uh, he was on a mission and he was making a difference. And, well, I think our hearts, this is one of those places where our heart tells us, don't let your mind go to bad alternatives that throw out the meaning you know is real. And mm-hmm. so I think the Christian worldview, though it has a, a problem of pain and suffering, I think still makes the most sense. And I ultimately trust that uh, there is a God who knew what he was doing. I don't think he killed Nabil, but I think he did allow mm-hmm. Nabil to die. And uh, for reasons I think, uh, you know, when I get to heaven, my hand will be up. You know, that'll be a question I'll want to know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know wh- why, God? Why, why would you allow that? And while you're at it, why did Keith Green have to go to it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so just as an example here, uh, Romans 8 girl said, yes, I'd like to hear Mark's response to that question as someone who prayed daily, often on my face for him uh, to be healed. And I've I've heard that from, from people around the world. But, you know, it at the end of the day, we just don't have all the answers. We don't, uh, we're, we're not in, we're not in heaven yet. And we don't even know what kind of uh, answers we're going to get when we're in a state um, of eternity. But uh, what Mark pointed out is, uh, is very important. You, you have to consider the alternatives, right? Like, uh, yeah. um, so think about the alternatives here. He, he mentioned atheism. So what, what's the alternative? And the reason is because uh, my, my PhD thesis was on the, the problem of evil, um, a, 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 yeah. a, a highly <clears throat> philosophical argument version of the argument called uh, the Bayesian argument from evil. But uh, so I had to I had to read almost every major work that's ever been written, every major paper and so on that's ever been written on the on the problem of evil. But uh, it's so so frequent for for, you know, popular level atheists to, to point to, you know, children dying or something like this. Look, where's your God? Look, look, how how do you reconcile this with your worldview? Look at what your your worldview can't account for this. And I mean, just think of the alternative. What is the atheist alternative? <laughs> Too bad. You're a sack of, you know, you're a sack of molecules. The world yeah. doesn't care about you, so just die. Get it over with, right? right? That's the that's the atheist alternative. Yeah. And can I throw in, David, mm-hmm. that uh, you just kind of described a little bit um, C.S. Lewis's testimony. Uh, you know, we know C.S. Lewis is a Christian apologist mm-hmm. and author who wrote Mere Christianity and Chronicles of Narnia. Well, he was, before any of that, he was an atheist at Oxford. And obviously brilliant then, before and after. 
And he used these very kinds of arguments to say, I can't believe in a God that allows pain and suffering, mm-hmm. where he allows evil, uh, that, you know, that, um, that just doesn't make sense, so I'm going to be an atheist. And then he, as he wrote later, he said he came to realize that atheism is just too simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, he realized that he was calling something good without any objective standard for good, um, he said, how would, you know, one of his analogies is, how would I know what a straight line was? Excuse me, how would I know what a crooked line was mm-hmm. unless I had a notion of what a straight line is? He said, the very fact that I was complaining about evil and knew that evil was real betrayed the fact that deep down somewhere I knew there was a good standard, and that only makes sense, he felt, and I believe, uh, when it's grounded in a good God, mm-hmm. uh, and it's there you have an objective moral standard. And so the atheist who railed against God or belief in God because of evil actually was persuaded in part by the realization that the, the reality of evil points to a good standard. It points to a good God, a moral lawgiver. Mm-hmm. And he describes this in his book, Near Christianity, in a beautiful way. But it's interesting that even, the, I think, the, the greatest argument against Christianity through uh the kind of spiritual jujitsu that uh, C.S. Lewis did with those thoughts uh, ended up being one of the strongest arguments for Christianity, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and of course, a lot of other evidence that we can mm-hmm. talk about. Um, someone put, Pearl points out Rich Mullins also taken in a violent uh, auto accident, and uh, for those of you who don't know Rich Mullins, uh, since we're talking about Nabil, um, that was one of Nabil's favorite songs, and uh, it's one of the. There are several things I wish I'd gotten. Um, while Nabil was uh, still here with us, and one was him singing um, "If I Stand" as uh, in the car, as 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 we're driving somewhere, and he would uh, that would come on, and he would uh, uh, he would sing that. And so, uh, but but you know, check out that song. That has a, has an important meaning. But then you know, you've got Rich Mullins, who um, the guy who sang the song, um, and then dies in a horrible accident. So these are the things that you know we have to deal with. But again, um, what are the alternatives here? Um, so you have you have the, the atheistic alternative. Well, so what? It's all you know. It's all pointless. There's the reason these bad things happen is because no one's watching out for us, and this is what's going to happen to all of us, and that's just life. Too bad. And then you have the Islamic, the Islamic claim, which uh, is very, I find very interesting because I've seen Muslims. Ah, this is the evidence. This is evidence that Nabil was wrong and that God cursed him. Uh, but think about that. If that's actually your position. Muslims, the Muslims who are watching, and I know you're watching here. That's actually your position. Um, your prophet died in horrible agony, so much so. Um, and it was because he'd been poisoned by a Jewish woman whose family had been slaughtered by Muslims. And so Muhammad, after a couple of years, one of, his, one of his companions dropped dead as soon as he ate the poison. Muhammad had put some in his mouth. And it affected him, right? It, it it messed him up internally, but he survived, right? Like if you drink a bunch of Drano, you're going to die. If you drink a little bit of Drano, you're going to survive, but it's going to do internal damage. Muhammad survived for about three years after that in horrible agony. And he said in Sahih al-Bukhari 4428, the prophet in his ailment in which he died used to say, oh, Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Kaibar. And at this time, I feel my aorta being cut from that poison. So he was in agony all the time. If you want to know how much pain, Sudan ibn Majah, 1622. Aisha said, I never saw anyone suffer more pain than the messenger of Allah. So if you're taking horrible, painful deaths as evidence that God is against you, then my goodness, Aisha, who had seen war and bloodshed and horrible things all her life, said she never saw anyone go through what Muhammad, so what Muhammad went through. So if, if you were a Muslim, you really shouldn't take that position. Christians shouldn't take the position either that, you know, horrible bad things happen to you proves that God is against you because, you know, our our paradigm example is Jesus who had a horrible, violent death. Um, and, and that is an important point, Mark, that, uh, that when we think about the crucifixion, such a horrible, horrible death that anyone who believed that Jesus was the Messiah at that point would have thought this is the worst possible thing that could ever happen. Um, from a Christian perspective, when you're talking mm-hmm. about this is God incarnate, God, and if we think of the worst thing that could ever happen, it's not me suffering or me dying or something like that. The, the worst thing I can actually imagine would be the creator of all the universe, um, the one in whom we live and move and have our being entering our world 
and being tortured and mocked and killed by the people he absolutely sus- yeah and yet we look yeah, at that he, he suffered in ways we can't even comprehend yeah and <clears throat> what and so that the the takeaway message from the cross there is what looks to us like the worst possible thing that could ever happen was actually the greatest thing that could that could ever possibly happen and uh, so that's why when you see something you say oh my goodness why is that that looks so horrible it should be in your mind for all I know, this is one of the greatest things that's ever happened, and I just don't know why. Yep. Yeah. I, I want to throw in, too, I uh, had the privilege of going down and visiting the Beal when he was in, already in palliative care, knew that, you know, short of a miracle that he was near the end. And as it turned out, I, I was with him two days. It ended up being the, the latter day was five days before he died. Mm-hmm. And I was there with Lee Strobel and uh, Abdu Murray. And we had the privilege of praying with him and just spending time with him as well as his parents and his sister. And, um, and, you know, he was in and out of consciousness. He was very, you know, tired and, and so forth. But I can just tell anyone who wonders, Nabil stayed in that sense of peace and assurance that he knew his creator. He knew God not just as an almighty being, but as his father as jesus said he's our heavenly father he knew he had salvation in christ he did not doubt that Mm -hmm. Uh, he he had no fear of death in that i mean he didn't want to die he wanted to be here and uh you know be with michelle and his little girl and and continue his life and, and bless his family and all of those things naturally but he wasn't afraid of death and he had this assurance of heaven that I think God wants to give any of us mm-hmm. who will trust in Him, and uh, there was no shadow of turning mm-hmm. in the deal, even right at the end. Yeah, and uh, Doctor Tor, who was also friends with uh, Nabil, he pointed that out that he was uh, he was with him regularly um, during that time, and even one of Nabil's last videos that he that he posted, uh, one of his one of his last vlogs, uh, he said he was still praying for God to heal him, and that he was still asking uh, others to pray for him. But he said, but even if he doesn't, I still love him, and uh, that that was the message. Uh, that, that was same thing Job said basically though he slay me yet I yet I will trust him um and yeah. uh and and that has to be the Christian response and it's with I think part of the problem is that we uh the world has become far more hedonistic than it used to be right if you if you ask someone in the um, early Christians first century Christians second century Christians third century Christians what's the most important thing in the world you're not going to get pleasure or physical pleasure or something as an answer um, lots of people right. in our time um, easy living comfortable life you know nice house that sort of thing that that's 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 what's most important for lots of people whether whether they they admit it or not um, whereas in the first century that that would have been like you know comfortable life would have been like 15th on the list of all the other things that are of all, of all the things that are really important. Um, and, and you can see this because I mean, you know, again, we're thinking, Oh, Nabil went through such struggles. I mean, look at the apostle Paul. I mean, when, when he talks about, uh, what he went through, um, getting, yeah. uh, getting lashed by, um, getting lashed by the Jews, uh, beaten with rods by the Romans. Uh, they, they stoned him. Stone. Yeah. He was stoned, yeah. shipwrecked repeatedly. Um, in, he would say, "In dangers in the country, and dangers in the city, in danger everywhere." His, I mean, his life was one big mass of pain and danger. And he would have, been, by the time of his death, he would have been covered from the head down in scars and scar tissue. And yet, it never crosses the Apostle Paul's mind: "Hey, wait a minute! If God really loves me, why does all this bad stuff keep happening to me?" Uh, it just, it just wasn't yeah. part. It wasn't part of the part of the equation. He, he viewed it, and he said it. He was sharing in the sufferings of Christ mm-hmm. and counted it as an honor to get to do that for the sake of people who needed Christ. And, mm-hmm. and I think that was Nabil's same attitude. He even It really strikes me when I listen to that broadcast again, uh, how when he talks about death, it's just it's like, why don't you just kill me, God? Now yeah. I don't want to hurt my family. I mean, he was not afraid of that, yeah. and I think that is— the perspective for any of us who really have our relationship with Christ secure. Yeah, and that's why I can say to jihadis, uh, <laughs> you want to kill me, uh, I recommend the carotid artery right under the uh, left ear. And I uh, um, oh, just wanted to uh, point out for, for Jacqueline here. Uh, Jacqueline said, sorry, I didn't see all the Q&A after his testimony. What happened to Nabil? Well, Jacqueline, I, I don't know if you were paying attention for the past couple of years, but um, uh, Nabil did lots of work um 
Awesome. I can't think of too many people who did more in such a short amount of time. Um, right. But Nabil eventually got a diagnosis of stomach cancer. And um, when he first got the diagnosis, they said stage three. Um, but they they said you have to go to a to a, a specialist to get a, a more a more accurate diagnosis. And when he went to the specialist, they actually said stage four. And so it's like a it's something like a four percent survival rate over over five years. And so uh, Nabil went through um, chemo. He had lots of people praying for him. And so the issue we brought up is basically, uh, you know, why why would that sort of thing happen? And um, I, I want to say everyone. That is absolutely normal and understandable to have that reaction. You know, when I think, hey, if he did that much, if he accomplished that much in 12 years, what would he have done with another 12 years or with another 20 years or with another 30 or 40 years? That guy, he could have written 30 books. Um, yeah. So, you know, when you think so that that's that's the line of thinking. So you think, you know, gosh, why does this sort of thing have to happen? Um but you know you can go too far with that and i, I had one person contact me after um after nabil's funeral and he said when i found out nabil died i cursed god and i'm done with god um there you going too far because as mark pointed out earlier what's what's the alternative right it's all it's all meaningless it's all pointless that that's not exactly a a better alternative at the end of the day we have to remember here that we know god exists um if we know anything no matter what we see happen around us if we know that jesus died on the cross for our sins that god entered creation to die on the cross for us and then rose from the dead one we know that we will rise from the dead as well because that's what he tells us and we know that he loves us because he did if he did that sort of thing and that's why that, that those early generations of christians you could feed them to lions they still knew that God. They still knew yeah. that God loved them, no matter no matter what happened to them. Um, all right, Mark. So, what's uh, what would be as far as Nabil um, sharing his testimony? Whose idea was that, by the way, to uh, to have that to have that uh, to have Nabil come out with you and Lee for that simulcast? You know, I don't even remember. I know his book had just come out, mm -hmm. and we wanted to do something to let people know about it. Um, I don't remember who even had the idea, but, you know, let's let him tell his story. And, um, boy, what a powerful night. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I wanted to just take a minute to talk about, you, you were talking about how much he got done. And, you know, he wrote oh, yeah. three books. Two of, them, two of them became New York Times bestsellers, mm -hmm. uh, which is just unheard of for a new author. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I just want to encourage people. Uh, you know, a lot of people know of Nabil. Uh, maybe they've, you know, watched his testimony. Maybe they watched his broadcast. But there's nothing like reading his books. And uh, I want to just highlight, especially the last one and the first one. The last one's a little more, a little deeper on the ins and outs of Islam and Christianity. It's called No God But One. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great. It's just a fabulous book. That was the last thing he wrote. But I, I just, I wanted to go back to his first one, which is, you know, basically his storybook, the book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Uh, when Nabil and I first talked about it, and the more I, I knew of Nabil's story and the more I got to know him, I, uh, you know, my background is I'm in ministry and I've been ministry partners with Lee Strobel for now 30 years uh, and was there, you know, actually helping edit and be part of the process of him writing his classic book, The Case for Christ, which is just a fabulous book and movie mm -hmm. now. But uh, I remember saying to Nabil, I, I said, I think you're seeking all of finding Jesus book. I think it's going to be like The Case for Christ for the Muslim world mm -hmm. and for people with questions about Islam. And I really think that turned out to be true. And I mean, the, the quality of his writing especially when you know he was traveling all over the world and mm -hmm. getting another degree and starting a family. <laughs> and I mean, I remember when he told me, I said, how long, when are you ever going to write your book? He goes, I'm, I'm going to do it in the next, uh, whatever it was, like three or four months or something. I said, you're crazy. This is your first book. Mm -hmm. It's got to be good. <laughs> and then he sends me a draft of the first part. And I was like, my goodness, this book is good. And I remember sending to Lee Strobel, who's been a lifelong reporter and writer and, you know, award-winning journalist, and Lee just read it, and he said, this kid is naturally gifted. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I often tell people, you know, I only have a handful of books I think everyone in the world should read. And yes, Case for Christ is one of them. Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis is one of them. 
but Seeking All of Finding Jesus is one of those books mm-hmm. for everyone. And uh, if you're a Christian, you'll know much more about your own faith as well as you'll know more about Islam, you'll know, and you'll love Muslims more because Nabil's love, as we said earlier, just comes across. Uh, one other thing I want to say about the book, and I, I, I don't know if you can see it on there, I've got, there's an updated copy, it's the third edition, and it's still the same story, but he's added, there's a bunch of us that wrote what he called expert testimonies or expert, expert sections, Mm-hmm. Those are in here now. Originally, they were just online. But the, the coolest part is, um, well, Michelle wrote reflections at the end that are just really beautiful. This was written after he passed away, kind of a memorial edition. Mm-hmm. So Michelle wrote some reflections. I was honored to be asked to write an afterward, so I tell some of the stories and just some, my, some of my own thoughts about Nabil and his life. And then a really cool section is there's a, a dialogue between you, uh, David Wood, and Nabil, uh, where you guys are going back and forth and kind of remembering things from his past and mm-hmm. his story and how he came to faith. And so anyway, I just want to let people know it's a, a beautiful book. It's, it's a, the story is so compelling, and uh, that third edition is definitely one to read and pass around to friends, and mm-hmm. uh, I think you'll benefit from doing so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, that would certainly be one, one of the uh, most important books um, in apologetics um, that that are that exist right now. Um, when when people ask me uh, what they should read as far as uh, dealing with with Muslims and interacting with Islam or responding to to Islam, uh, I usually tell them start off with seeking Allah, finding Jesus. Uh, read, I do the same thing. Yeah, uh, read that because that helps you really get in in, in the mind of a of a Muslim. And you you could after that go to No God But One. And if I were giving like a, a sort of uh, like top five list, then then No God But One would also be in there. But if I were if I were just giving three, it would be start off with Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, and then um, Answering Islam by Norm Geisler because uh, that, that's just that's just an awesome book. The the way that book is is broken down. He starts off the first uh, him and Ab- Abdul Salib. They start off with the the first third of the book is just explaining what Islam teaches. And Muslims who read that section will say, that is an awesome explanation of Islam. Is They don't criticize criticize Islam at all. They just say, here is what it teaches. And then the second third of the book is um, a response to Islam's claims. And then a third is a defense of Christian uh, Christian claims against Muslim objections. So uh, that's an awesome book. Um, and after, uh, in addition to those two, since since it's important to understand jihad, uh, Robert Spencer's book, the, the History of Jihad. And if you if you if you yeah. read those three, you you'll be very well equipped for uh, for a lot of. And, and then they they are also going to need the book you still need to write, David. But uh, hopefully that will be before. Oh yeah, and, and guys, because like like twenty of you here here and in the uh, here and during the uh, the the stream of of Nabil's testimony, were saying, David, when are you writing a book? Uh, I started, I just like making videos so much and, uh, and Mark and some really awesome people are always, uh, uh, bothering me to, to, uh, finish, finish something that I, that I've started. Um, so uh, in fact, recently when I did an April fool's prank and I said I was done, uh, I got a bunch of messages. Cool. You're finally done. Now you can get to finish writing these. Uh, yeah. I fell for that one too. Yeah. I have to admit it. Hey, um, I, I also want to say, in fact, a couple of things I want to do, and I do need to run here, but um, any of our Muslim friends uh, or people that are Muslims who don't want to call us friends yet, um, I just want to urge you to read Nabil's book. Uh, it's easy to talk about it and theorize about it and criticize it or whatever you want to say, but read it mm-hmm. and do have the courage to do what Nabil did. To, to say, you know, would the real God please stand up? Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm right, confirm me in my beliefs in Allah. Mm-hmm. If I'm wrong, I want to know. I and mean, if you're wrong, you want to know, don't you? Well, Nabil's book will gently walk you through the journey of a loving, great guy who you just saw. I mean, what a great... Uh, he, anyone would be blessed to have a friend like Nabil. Mm-hmm. And you know, you read his book and he kind of becomes your friend Mm -hmm. and you get the details, you hear the story and you see a guy wrestling with, you know, coming out of a loving, close, tight knit Muslim family. And I've met his whole family. They are wonderful people, wonderful people, Mm -hmm. but read the story and really open your heart and, and try to, you know, say, is there something here I need to learn? 
or at least consider or look into more deeply. And I think you'll be blessed if you do it. And if, if I could just maybe do a last thought here, David. Um, I have one more quick question for you, but then, yeah, but go ahead and share your thoughts. Or, or no, go ahead, go ahead and do that. Oh, yeah, I, I, just wanted, I, I just wanted to know, um, uh, I haven't heard much from uh, um, about Nabil's family since, since the funeral. Um, so I was wondering what, what, uh, like, uh, I, I know like my, uh, my wife is friends with his sister with Jiha on, on Facebook and so on, but, um, yeah, you have any info on the, on, on the Beals family? Because I've heard um, from a, heard from a lot of people asking that. Yeah, I, I don't have real close contact. Mm -hmm. I, I became friends with them when I met them, you know, right before Nabil died. And then, you know, mm -hmm. I saw him at the funeral service and, uh, I, text with them now and then, try to send them encouraging thoughts once in a while. I pray for them. Honestly, I pray that God would reveal himself in a very direct way to them, mm -hmm. the way he did to Nabil mm -hmm. uh, through Christ. Um, but they're wonderful people, um, tender-hearted. Of course, they're broken-hearted mm -hmm. with the love of Nabil, especially on a day like today, and I, I would encourage everyone to pray for them today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a very tender thing. They lost, you know, it was a small family, I mean, just, mm -hmm. uh, which you had in, in the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, but I, I, you know, I, I don't know what else to say. I, I think, you know, I trust that God is at work there, and I pray that he is. Um, but um, just pray mm -hmm. for him, and yep. um, truth will prevail. Mm -hmm. Um Here's, here's my thought, and I was watching the video there and uh, kind of looking at the line of characters on that stage, including, uh, if you watch the whole broadcast we just had, uh, you had Robbie Zacharias at the beginning, uh, and then we had your surprise appearance there, David. Mm -hmm. uh, it's <laughs> oh, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, you, I, 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 I never watched that since I since I sent it to you. And so that was what right there was the first time I'd watched that since I sent it to you all those years ago. And I was like, whoa, that was awesome. <laughs> oh, the, the surprise twist of that opening example of the tall, good looking, uh, brilliant apologist was great. And I, I don't know if you could hear on the video, but the people in the audience. I heard him laughing. At the, Oh, they howled over that. And, that. and by the way, that was at a great church, Christ mm -hmm. Church in Jacksonville, where I uh, still teach mm -hmm. uh, now and then. But here, here's what strikes me, and I, I really want to make this personal for the people mm -hmm. who are viewing today. Um, that was a cast of unlikely characters. Um, and what I mean by that, uh, unlikely uh, candidates for salvation. Um, you, you know, let me start with Ravi since he appears early on. Ravi Zacharias is known now as one, you know, one of the great Christian scholars and thinkers, and you know, I think one of the best communicators on the planet. But if you read his book, Walking East to West, you find out he grew up in a very confused uh, situation in India, uh, surrounded by Hindus and Hinduism didn't know what to think, got very down and depressed as a young man, tried to commit suicide when he was 17. Uh, God rescued him through that and used that. He ends up becoming a follower of Christ and having just a, a tremendous influence on people around the world. Um, Lee Strobel, who opened the whole night. Uh, most people know his story. I probably don't need to go into depth, but here's a guy who yeah, he grew up in a nominal church situation, rejects it, becomes an atheist, loves his freedom, really is enjoying life, marries an agnostic gal named Leslie, and then the worst possible thing happens in his perspective, and that was she becomes a Christian. And then he tries to disprove it and tries to talk her out of it, and over the next two years is bowled over by the evidence for the resurrection of Christ, becomes a follower of Christ. My story is the most vanilla of all the people on that stage, but I, you know, I grew up in the church. I did wander away and was kind of a low-key prodigal son for five years, but God did what it took to bring me back and uh, got my attention in ways he needed to. But then I come to you and the Beal. Um, and if anyone has a watch David's testimony, there's a 33-minute testimony. Over a million people have watched now. I mean, David goes to prison for trying to murder his father and meets a guy who's in prison on 26, was it 26 felon uh, charges? 
something like that. And this guy has already come to Christ. He's the only person who has the courage or character to stand up to it. David would in the middle of his narcissistic, crazy state that he was in at that point. And over time, God works on David Wood, leads David to Christ. Talk about an unlikely candidate. Then David gets out, goes to college, ends up becoming part of a debate team and meets a young man named Nabil. And then six more years of dialogue ensues before Nabil gives his life to Christ and bows the knee to Christ. I, I'm just trying to make a, a, a point here. The God delight in reaching people who are far from him. He does not give up on you. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, you know, he was responsible for helping eliminate murder uh, early Christians. David had similar background and, and propensity. Uh, Nabil was from another religion. Uh, Lee Strobel was an atheist. I was just a backslidden Christian. God can reach you where you are. And this is ultimately not, my illustration is really not about any of the five or six people I'm talking about, Robbie or any of us. It's ultimately about you. Uh, you know, if, if you have not given your life to Christ, if you're saying, I, I'm too far from that, or I've done too many things that he could never forgive, or I've already embraced other lifestyles or other belief systems, I just want to tell you, there's a, a real thing out there called the Holy Spirit. He's a person. He is the, the God of the universe, who I think is probably speaking to you right now. And I think he is he's telling you this stuff is true. What Nabil found is the truth. What David Wood preaches about is true. Uh, what this guy Mark is talking about is true. And I think the Holy Spirit confirms that in our hearts. And uh, I just want to urge you, if, if you're feeling that right now, or maybe you've felt it for a while, but you've just kind of been pushing God back and saying, I, I'm not ready. I don't want to get too radical. I don't want to get crazy with this, you know. I just want to say, don't get crazy or get radical. Just simply stop running from the God who loves you. And say, I I need what these guys all found. I am a sinner, and I need a Savior. And it's as simple as that. You stop fighting, you stop running, and you basically, whether literally or figuratively, you bow your knees and say, God, you love me. I, I now believe you're my father. I believe Jesus did die on the cross for my sins. Forgive me. I need it. I need your grace, your forgiveness, your salvation. And I open myself up to you right now. And I would just urge you, if, if you've never done that, that's something you can do right now. And uh, I, I don't know if you normally do your do prayer in your videos, David, but I'd just like to pray for anyone who's kind of at that point right now. And if you're not, and if you're going, this doesn't even make sense to me, keep seeking. You know, Jesus said, if you seek, you'll find. Uh, read Nabil's book. Read, you know, watch some of David's videos. Uh, watch some of Ravi Zacharias and read The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. I have some books as well. Uh, we've got materials that can answer questions and give you help. But before I go, I would just like to pray for any of you that maybe are really on the fence there. You're on the edge. And I'd just like to ask God to kind of help you into his family right now. And so let's just pray. Father, please just touch anyone who's at that point, anyone you've been drawing. Uh, help them to know your spirit is real and he's with them. And that your message of the, the gospel, the, the message of the cross of Christ is true. And that God so loved the world, he so loved us so loved you that he sent his only begotten son to pay the penalty to die in our place. And so please, uh, Lord, help anyone who's ready right now, help them right now to say, yes, Jesus. Yes, I receive your forgiveness. I receive your grace. I receive new life. I receive salvation through you. And now give me the wisdom and the courage and the power I need to live for you from this day forward. Give me the chance to influence other people the way Nabil did so powerfully. Give me the chance to influence people like David does or uh, Lee Strobel or any of these other people. Um, and I just hope you prayed that. And if you did, I hope you'll let us know. And I hope you'll grow and, and 
seriously, you know, then get radical about following Christ because your life will be an adventure of serving him, of making a difference, of impacting other people's lives, and whether you live to be 36 like Nabil or, uh, you know, really old like uh, some of us, um, your life will be an adventure, and God will use you in a powerful way. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'm assuming you have to head out now? Yeah, I do need to get going, but uh, it's a pleasure to do this, David. I, I love what you do. I watch your videos, and uh, I, I, half the time they shock me, but I always learn <laughs> something. And That's my goal. I appreciate what you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you're entertaining, and uh, you're very educational at the same time, so keep it up. All right. Thank you, brother, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. God bless everyone. See you later. All right, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it's cool having Mark here. Uh, wasn't joking when um said uh, Mark is, is one of the coolest Christians around. Everyone who knows him says that. He's got one of the awesomest families I've ever seen um, in my entire life. Uh, I find myself deliberately provoking a couple of them occasionally just to see how they how they react. But um, uh, so I didn't want to go too late tonight because uh, those of you who've been here for a while, we did have, uh, we did have, you know, Two hours, two hours watching uh, Nabil's testimony and and the Q and A. Um, <clears throat> uh, I did want to talk about uh, two things before we go, and I'll take a couple questions. And I actually want to answer the the comment of uh, Islamic Dawa here, just because it's kind of an awesome example of uh, a lot of what Nabil's talking about, a lot of what uh, apologists talk about. Um, but before that, I wanted to just mention what I call resurrection thinking. Right um, earlier, I mentioned that. Jesus dying on the cross, right? Um, that, if you didn't know about the resurrection and you didn't know that the crucifixion of Jesus had a purpose, that would be the worst thing that could ever happen, right? Once you know about the purpose for Jesus' death and you know about his resurrection, it turns out to be the greatest thing in all of history. What looks like the worst event in all of history is actually the greatest event in all of history. So that should let us all know that when things seem like they're they're bad or something like that, it should be in the back of our minds, you know, this could actually be a really, really great thing. That's that's resurrection thinking. So <clears throat> we talk about someone like Nabil. We say, look at all the amazing things he had already done. He could have been capable of so much, but, but guess what? We're Christians who believe in the resurrection. So one, uh, Nabil went to be with Jesus. Two, we'll see Nabil again. And three, God can raise up a thousand Nabils, right? And in fact, I'm, I'm hoping that, that, that some of you over here, some of you over here will be the next Nabils. I don't mean the person Nabil. I mean the next, uh, the next apologist to carry the gospel throughout the world. So anyway, that's resurrection thinking. And uh, that's, uh, that's the, the basis of, of Christian hope. And I did want to address a comment from Islamic Dawah here because he kept posting the same comment over and over again. And this is just a perfect example. This is something that Nabil had gone through. Um, it's something that, that any Muslim who decides to take um, his journey seriously and decides to pursue truth is going to have to deal with. Um, <clears throat> look what Islamic Dawah posted here. It says, look, John 5.30, Jesus said, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Now, what is that What is that supposed to mean? What are we supposed to take away from that? Well, it's just a popular verse that Muslims share that is supposed to refute the deity of Christ. Look, Jesus said, so Zakir Naik does this, Ahmed Didat does this, Every uh, uh, almost every Muslim apologist you'll hear will do this. And you see a couple things here. Um, one, you'll see the concept of cherry picking, right? For some reason, Muslims do understand the concept of cherry picking, right? You could take a verse out of the Quran. They'll say, no, you have to examine the context. They don't apply the same methodology to the Bible. And it never crosses the minds of many Muslim apologists, even the top Muslim apologists, to apply the exact same reasoning to the Bible. Hey, we better read the entire passage to make sure that we understand what's actually being said. Instead, it's cherry picking, completely distorting the meaning of a passage. And so, uh, one, we have to be aware of when uh, Muslim apologists are doing this because we, you, you have to be able to show them that they're doing, the, uh, doing it. And uh, 
Two, you you need to know what's being said here, right? If you're a Christian and you know that Muslims are going to be bringing this up, you should you should be prepared uh, because you want to understand what Jesus is saying. Is Jesus saying, "Hey, he's just he's just helpless here"? Is that what he's saying? Um, I do believe I have the technology to put this passage on the screen. Let me see. Uh, I've only I think I've only done this once or twice before, and I had it set up beforehand to do that. So I'm going to try and do it right now let me try this oh it worked hey that was easy wow that's awesome hey that's really cool <laughs> all right so here we have here we have the passage right now notice where our muslim friends go they go straight to up oh, let me get this off the screen here our muslim friends go matter of fact let me move this over a little bit so it's i guess it's okay if i'm on the screen all right so our muslim friends go right down to verse 30 so that they can show, hey, Jesus said by himself, he can do nothing. He can't do anything, man. He's saying that he's just, you know, he's a helpless, mere human being, mere mortal. And that's all he's saying there. Well, why don't we do something crazy? Why don't we look at the passage in context? In context, if you read, so we, we don't need to read the passage before verse 16, but uh, you're free to go back and do that. Um, it's about Jesus performing a miracle on the Sabbath. So Jesus, is, Jesus has performed a miracle on the Sabbath. Jesus performed a miracle on the Sabbath. The Jewish leaders considered that work. And so they're basically saying you are working on the Sabbath when you're not allowed to work. Therefore, you are breaking the law. You cannot be a true, devout servant of God if you're violating the Sabbath. Now, let's go through, let's go to uh, verse 16 here. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, and by the way, everyone, notice this is the passage Muslims go to to show that Jesus was actually a devout Muslim. So we're going we're gonna to read the passage and you see, we'll see, does this sound like Jesus is a devout Muslim prophet? Or does it sound like he's claiming to be God who is a member of the Trinity? Let's see. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. So he'd healed someone on the Sabbath. They said that's work. They began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Now notice what he just said, because this makes them flip out. Jesus said, the father is working, so I'm going to work too. Now think about that, because mere human beings were under the law, and they had to not work on the Sabbath. There was a discussion among the Jewish rabbis does God work on the Sabbath? And the conclusion was, yes, God works on the Sabbath because God is upholding and sustaining the universe. And so God works on the Sabbath, but we, us human beings, we don't get to work on the Sabbath. What does Jesus say? My father, is that what he'd be calling uh, God if he's a Muslim? No. Uh, according to the Quran, Allah is a father to no one. Not in any sense. But what does Jesus say here? My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. So notice, since the father is working, I'm working too. But, well, but wait a minute, what are ordinary human beings supposed to be doing? Not working. But Jesus is putting himself in the same category as the father. If the father is working on the Sabbath, then I am too. Now that should be shocking. It was shocking to the people, and they... and. He got in trouble over that. Watch what happened. So Jesus said, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. So now they're not just persecuting. Now they want to kill him. Why? For blasphemy. He put himself in the same category with the father. But, here, and here's the key, and without this, you can't understand the rest of the passage. What Jesus said, they misinterpreted. They concluded that he is claiming to be another God who's equal to the Father, right? Is Now, according to Christian theology, is that the correct interpretation of the passage? No, it's not. That's, 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 that's it. They would have an incorrect understanding of what Jesus was claiming. Jesus spends the rest of the passage explaining Christian theology to them. Muslims go to one little part, take it out of context, completely twist and distort the meaning, and then claim that they truly follow, that they, 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 they love Jesus by doing that, that they love truth by doing that. Let's look. So for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. What did they conclude? Not that he is one with the father, in one with the father in essence, as 
as a person of the Trinity. No, that's not what they concluded. They concluded that he is claiming to be equal with God, right? There's God, and then Jesus is claiming to be equal with God. So he's claiming to be another God, right? Watch what Jesus said. <clears throat> and the reason, guys, pay attention to this. Watch it multiple times, because this is one of the four or five most common passages. It might even be number one or number two of the most common passages that Muslims will go to in the New Testament to show that Jesus is denying his, his own deity. So if you get this down, very important. You're going to hear this all the time from Muslims. So for this reason, he tried all. So for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. They misunderstood what he said. They think that he's saying he's another God, who's equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer: <clears throat> "Very truly, I I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself." I've seen Muslims many times just take that part. See, the Son can do nothing by himself. The son can do nothing by himself. You say, you see that? But they like to go to verse 30 because even there, Jesus says son, right? They don't want to, they don't want to, they don't want to call, they don't want Jesus calling himself the son. But <laughs> what's the other problem? Guys, try and finish that verse. Muslims, if you're going to use that verse, Jesus saying that he can do nothing of himself, you might want to try finish finishing the verse. So very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. Guys, does someone who says, hey, whatever God does, I do also. Is that a person who is claiming to be a mere human prophet? The only way you could say you do the same things as the father is if you share the essence and nature of of the father. Now think about this because in that verse you have you have you don't you they haven't talked about the whole they're not talking about the holy spirit right here but you see the relationship between father and son and this is I mean th this entire passage is thoroughly trinitarian. Again, you don't have the discussion of the holy spirit right here, but once you include the discussion of the holy spirit mainly from uh, John 14, 15, 16 and you put it together with this, guys, the, the, the only legitimate way to understand this passage is in a Trinitarian context. For some reason, Muslims go to this passage, they completely distort what Jesus is saying, cherry pick verse 30, ignore everything else Jesus said and the point he's actually trying to make and claim that they are on the side of truth. So let's read that part again. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. Now notice, why does he say the son can do nothing by himself? What happened right before that? They, they, they thought that he's claiming to be another God. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm not claiming to be some separate God that can go and do things and can go around breaking the Sabbath because I'm a rogue deity. He's saying, I can do nothing by myself. What's he mean by, my, by myself there? He means separate from the Father. Christians, do we believe that Jesus does anything separate from the Father? That Jesus does anything by himself separate from the Father? No, he's one with the Father. He, he, of course not. It, it makes no sense. So what is Jesus saying here? Is he saying he is a mere human being, a mere creation, a mere prophet? Is that what he's claiming here when he says the Son can do nothing of himself? Or is he saying, hey, guys, if you think I'm claiming that I'm just in, I mean, if you think I'm claiming that I'm a separate God, you're wrong. I can't do anything separate from the Father. I can do nothing by myself separate from the Father. Which one's he doing? Well, obviously, given what he said here, he could do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the whatever the son, whatever the father does, the son also does. He's the only way you can do everything the father does is if you have the same nature and essence as the father. But he's pointing out, I'm not someone who is a copy of the father and I'm a separate God. I'm one with the father, not separate, not by myself, one with the father, but I still do the same things the father does. Is this a passage where Jesus is denying his deity? Absolutely not, right? Let's keep reading. Verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So Jesus gives life talking about resurrection here Jesus gives life to whom he is to those to whom, to whom he is pleased to give it moreover the father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the son now that's interesting because according to both the old testament and according to the quran god is the final judge of all people 
right? So, according to the Old Testament, God is our final judge. According to the Quran, Allah is our final judge. Jesus here says, hey, even though I do the same things that the Father does, the, the, and the, again, the only way to understand that would be that he shares the nature and attributes of the Father. The Father is not the one who judges. I'm the one who judges. And why? Why would the Son be the final judge? Notice, this only makes sense if the Son is also Yahweh. This only makes sense if the Son is also Yahweh. Because according to the Bible, Yahweh is the final judge. According to the Quran, Allah is the final judge. So this it only makes sense for Jesus to be saying that all judgment is his if he's part of the nature of God, which he is, he is already explaining here. Right? <clears throat> so verse 22 again. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Why is that? Verse 23. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Could any mere human being say, you have to honor me the same way you honor God? Could any mere human being say that? I mean, of course, you, a, a human being could say it. Right? An atheist could say that, right? But it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be true coming from someone unless, uh, you know, it's, come, it's true coming from Jesus. So why has, he, has the Father entrusted all judgment to the Son? That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. What mere human being can say? you have to honor me the same way you honor the Father. Once again, that would only make sense. It would only make sense to honor the Son just as you honor the Father if the, if the Son has the same nature and attributes as the Father. We honor God because of who he is. If you honor Jesus in the same way, then you see the problem? You see the problem, Muslims? For, for This is the passage you go to. This is your go-to passage to deny the deity of Christ. Islamic Dawah could have posted anything he wanted over in the comment section. And what does he post? This passage to, to prove that Islam is true. Let's keep reading. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Do Muslims honor the Son? Do they honor the Son the same way they honor the Father? Do they even honor God as Father? Is Jesus affirming Islam here? He is condemning Islam. He is condemning Islam in every... He is condemning Islamic theology in every possible way right here. And Muslims go to this passage. But they leave all of this out. Absolute deception here. Absolute deception from, a, from, a, from Muslim, uh, Muslim Dawah here. Islamic Dawah. Notice, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. What is Jesus saying here, Muslims? He's saying, if you do not honor me as God, you are not honoring the Father either. And this is, this is your go-to passage. All right, let's keep going. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. What are the dead going to hear at the resurrection? The voice of the Son of God. Who raises the dead? Jesus does. Well, wait a minute. That's very interesting because according to both the Quran and the Old Testament, it's God who raises the dead at the resurrection. Jesus says, no, he does. Once again, this passage only makes sense if Jesus is Yahweh. So let's keep going. Um, verse 26, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted, to, granted the son also to have life in himself, right? So Jesus has life in himself, right? It's not, it's not external. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. So because Jesus is, because the son has now become incarnate, he gets authority to judge because he's also the son of man. Do not be amazed at this. And we're going to get to, we're going to get to the verse that Muslims completely destroy. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. When all who he, when all who are in the graves, notice that's everyone. That's Muhammad. That's Abu Bakr. That's Umar. That's Uthman. That's Ali. That's every Muslim who's ever existed. When are you going to come out of your graves when you hear the voice of the sun? That, is, that, is, that, is that a normal prophet thing to say? 
Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Remember, what, what, what is evil in the context here? Denying the Father. How do you deny the Father? By denying the Son. <clears throat> you see this passage here? And come out. So they will hear his voice, the voice of the Son, and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Muslims, according to this passage, <clears throat> are you rising to be condemned, or are you rising to live, according to this passage? Um, just imagine this. If you take this passage and you completely distort the meaning, you completely massacre what Jesus is saying here, completely distort the meaning to lead people away from the truth, what do you think is going to happen when you rise at the resurrection when you hear the voice of the Son and you have to stand before him at the resurrection? And he, according to the passage, is the one who judges you and you have to give an account for why you led people away from him and completely distorted the meaning of his words right here. Where, where do you think you're going? According to Jesus. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and read, uh, starting at verse 28 again, because then we get to verse 30, which is the one Muslims quote to show that Jesus is denying his own deity and he's just a mere human prophet of Islam. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. Those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. <laughs> You see there, ladies and gentlemen, he's just a prophet like, like Muhammad. By myself, I can do nothing. Given the context here, given the context, what is the context here? The context is people have accused Jesus of claiming to be a separate God. Jesus is correcting them by saying that he does nothing separate from the Father. He can't. He can only do things as one with the Father because that's who he is in, 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 in uh, essence and nature. So go ahead. Uh, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Is this Jesus denying his deity? Is this Jesus claiming to be a mere human prophet? You cannot understand this passage without understanding the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, and the, 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 the doctrine of the incarnation, because as the son who is incarnate, then he has, he has certain roles and certain things to do as the incarnate son, as the son of man. So um, Islamic Dawah had a perfect opportunity, a perfect opportunity to show us that Christianity is false. And the reason, again, the, there are lots of other things we could have said during this time. There are lots of other issues we could have covered. I wanted to cover that because we're talking about Nabil. And Nabil was in the same boat, right? Muslims hear these passages from their from their apologists and say, you see there, ha ha, the Bible actually confirms Islam, right? That, that's what that's what Nabil uh, believed about Christians, that the Bible actually points to Islam and refutes Christian theology. But how do they get that? Well, by doing this. Isn't that a shame? Muslims, how do you claim to be followers of the truth and to be people who respect Jesus when you twist things out of context and you would condemn us for doing that, right? You would, if, if, if I went and did that with the Quran and I completely distorted the meaning of a verse, or if I went to the Hadith and I, I took something Muhammad said and just completely ripped it out of context, distorted it to make people believe something that's false about it, would you think that's okay? No, you would, you would, you would condemn me as a liar, but that's what not just some uneducated random Muslim does, that's what your, your, your highest levels of apologists do with the text of the Bible and with the words of Jesus. Would, would, would the true religion need you to do this? Would the true religion need you to do this? I don't think it would. All right, guys, probably going to wrap it up there. Um, if you have any questions, now keep in mind, I talked for a long time and a ton of you and a ton of you left comments, so I don't have time to read all these or it would take forever. So I'm just going to scroll to the end, see if there are any last minute. So see if there are any last minute issues. Um, probably be wrapping it up um, after that. So any uh, and it'd be good to come back to, to, to Nabil here. I, I want to do that because I think actually taking a Muslim objection and uh, really breaking down the scripture and going through it and really exposing the heart of Islam and what it does and how it is actually an antichrist religion. It's trying to deny the son and in doing so is denying the father and denying the nature of God, that that's the actual purpose of Islam. Uh, I think that is, I think that is perfect. 
I think that is a perfect way to honor Nubil uh, this evening on his birthday. <laughs> and here we have Piers. What are you doing, Islamic Dawa? Picking a bunch of cherries. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, <clears throat> take a couple more questions here, and we'll wrap it up. <clears throat> David, what is your take on Orthodox Christianity? Um, I'm assuming you mean like Eastern Orthodox. Um, I've never studied a lot. Um, there are lots of issues, Calvinism and Arminianism that I haven't studied. Uh, lots of issues, uh, 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 end times, so eschatology. People always ask, David, what's your view of end times? I don't have one. I've never taken a lot of time to study it. I usually don't like taking firm positions on issues unless I've spent a fair amount of time uh, studying the topic. And so, but the thing is, I'm, I'm always so busy dealing with Islam and sometimes atheism that I kind of never have time to, to deal with a lot of uh, other issues. So don't know a lot, don't know a lot about um, Orthodox Christianity. So basically, I mean, if you ask me what kind of Christian I am, I'm a bit, look, I read the Bible and, and I try to do it, what Jesus said and, and do what the apostles uh, said to do. So that's what I, if, if you were, if you were to, if you were to try to put me in a category and you, and, and I listed all my views, I would fall into the uh, probably non-denominational Protestant category um, because I, I never get more, more specific uh, than that. I could, I could, I, I, I could eventually go into like Calvinist or, or Arminian or something like that category, but it would, it would be after, I would want to study that. It, basically, anytime, anytime I have Christians that I really respect um, arguing for one position and then other Christians that I really respect arguing for a different position, I'm usually thinking, all right, that must mean that, that, both, that, that both of these sides um, have a case here. So they're, they're there are Calvinists. There are Calvinist uh, theologians that I really, really respect very highly. I respect their knowledge of Scripture much more than than I respect my own knowledge. Um, and the same thing with Arminians. There, there are Arminians who I really, really respect, and I know that these guys could run circles around me with their knowledge. And so I'm looking at that and saying, "What? Hey, I, I can't just make a decision right now. I, I would have to. I would have to really study this issue." So it's like that with 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 several things. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever if I'll ever get to uh, to go into a lot of these issues. Um, Cliff here, Cliff here says, how can you not have studied Calvinism versus Arminianism, especially given your cohorts? Well, I know that I know the basic, I know the basic arguments. Um, the problem is I think there's a good case to be made for each one. So, uh, Calvinism and Arminianism, each one can say, Hey, here's, here are some reasons, scriptural reasons to take this view seriously. Um, and there are important objections to each side, right? And this is, you know, this is how they interact. So each side says, ha, here's our case, and this is why it's true. And each side says, uh, but ha, you've got some problems with your, and how do you reconcile your view with, with these claims of scripture? So I know those, and, but that's the point. If I wanted to, well, okay, I see a case for this. I see a case for that. Uh, who do I go with here? Well, I wouldn't be able to answer that question without really going into a lot of, a lot of depth in it. So uh, what Cliff here is referring to is, uh, some of some of the some of my ministry partners are Vocab Malone and Anthony Rogers, who are both Calvinists. But here's the thing: they're friendly Calvinists, right? You have what are called like cage stage Calvinists, right? Where like they have to go out and refute and destroy everyone. They have like friendly Calvinists, right? Friendly Reformed guys like uh, like Anthony and Vocab, who uh, you know, if you want to talk about it, they'll talk about it, but. They're not going to be trying to ram that down your throat, or they're not going to have a problem if you if you don't uh, if you don't agree with their position. So uh, so yeah, so um, I might study that one day. It it is it is something I'm interested in, but I don't know if I'll ever. There are other things that I'm a bit more interested in. So if I ever get through some of the other issues, I might uh, might eventually get to that. <clears throat> uh, Belteshazzar says, "Hey, I'm non -denom I'm non denominational too. What a coincidence." Well, not really, not really a coincidence because, you know, if, if you've got hundreds of people over here and they have different positions, then someone's, several people are going to have the same, same position there. <clears throat> um, Calvinism, LD Walker, oh, we have some comment, oh, we have a, this is, guys, so we have, a, we have questions like this, which Christian sect is right? Um, Calvinism creates atheists. Guys, given what, <laughs> given what I just said, given, <laughs> given what I just said here, um, here we go. I'm, I'm bringing them up. 
what's wrong with going to a Pentecostal church? Um, so anyway, I'm bringing these up. I'm bringing these up because I'm, I'm literally sitting here saying, guys, I haven't taken firm positions on a lot of these issues, so I haven't taken a stance. Um, and then a bunch of questions that follow. What about all these specific details that, that David, you just said? You just said you don't have a firm position on, uh, on a lot of these issues. Um, guys, the, the, the point of all that was there are people who would be much, much, much better to discuss these things with than me. And I say that to... Um, I've said this. I've said this lots of times during live streams because I get comments every day, um, usually because there are lots of there are lots of Christians in uh, India who are really interested in, in apologetics. In fact, I'll say it, lots of the videos that I make, I I now get more views from India than I get from the United States. Right? That means they're, they're not not for all of them. Overall, the United States is still number one as far as as far as views. But for specific videos on lots of topics, I will get more views from India than I get from the United States. And that means that there's a real hunger over there. But and you can you can see why, right? If you're a Christian in India, you've got Hindus over here and you've got Muslims over here and and you're sort of Christian stuck in the middle. And so if you're interested in maintaining your Christianity, you have to you have to really you know, I mean you you have to you have to know your apologetics. And so um but because there are there are uh there are lots of Christians in India, like in America, not many people are, are, are too concerned about Hinduism because it's not in our, it's not in our face. Even if you have Hindu friends, they're not, they're not very aggressive in, uh, in preaching Hinduism to you. Um, so it's not a, it's not a huge issue in apologetics, but if you're a Christian in India, it is. And so lots of times every day, over and over again, um, I'll get messages from Christians in India who like my videos about Islam, and they say, oh, David really knows what he's talking about in Islam, and, and just, David, can you please start making videos about Hinduism? I'm just thinking, why would you, why would you even think that I, could, that I could make a good case against Hinduism? I'm sure I could, if I, but I, if I were going to do that, I would want to spend like four or five years studying Hinduism before I would respond to that, and I just don't have time, right? That's why Christians are a body. We have to do other, we have to do other things. So it, th my point here is Christians in India should be the ones responding to Hinduism, right? They're familiar with it. They're the ones with Hindu friends. They're the ones who should be, um, who should be really studying what their friends are saying, what the claims are. And by the way, I, I'll also point out, I get, I get, I get requests from Hindus to respond to Hinduism, right? So people who like what I'm, there are Hindus who like, and this is why it's interesting. There are Hindus who like what I say about Islam. And so what they're saying is, oh, David, David really studies a lot. So David, I would like to know what you have to say about Hinduism. And, um, in college, my 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 uh, in, in college, I was a double major in biology and philosophy. But my my philosophy degree was had an emphasis in religious study. So I did study world religions, but never enough to to where I would trust myself to go out and and speak confidently on some of the Eastern religions that I took classes on. But still, I mean, I would want to again, I would want to spend years studying these issues. So anyway, the idea here is this happens over and over again, right? We'll take some apologists that we like. Um, whether, you know, Sam Shamoon or um, William Lane Craig, James White or something like this. And, we'll, and we spend years watching that apologist. And then we think, oh, this apologist is really awesome. Therefore, I'll listen to what this person says about this other issue. Well, you, you don't know if that, I mean, you, you need to have a, a reason to trust that person on those, on those other issues, right? Because I mean, uh, otherwise you could say, oh, he's really smart over here. Therefore, I can trust him over here. That is a huge problem, right? I mean, it's, it's a similar problem. Like people listen to actors about their their worldview and their religious views. Why in the world would you listen to them? If you think they actually know something, then that would be one thing. But people, oh, tell, tell us what you think about the meaning of life and stuff. I've seen this on talk shows. Um, and so think about the reasoning there. Oh, I really like you because I liked your part in that movie and I think you're such a great actor. Therefore, please guide me on your on religion and, and things like that. Why would you think that that person has any clue what he or she is talking about? So it's, it's so, so the general point here is <clears throat> um, when you're looking into things and, and the main issue was like denominational differences and stuff like that, um, go to people don't go to me i'm not good i'm not i'm i'm not good i could i could be good if i spent a lot of years doing that but go to someone who who really knows what they're talking about and so i'm 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 honest enough to say hey these are areas where i am not someone you should be going to you should be going to people who who uh, who focus a lot on those things all right so it's 11:25 i will go i will go about another 3 minutes and we'll wrap up any final question um, about Nabil. 
Yeah, there's too many questions to get through. All right, so I'll just um, I'll bring it back. I'll bring it back to uh, to Nabil. Uh, Mark was Mark was mentioning how how really he's, Nabil's awesome abilities, really really smart. Um, I would know that um, when we were in class, he had an amazing ability to be listening to two things at once because he mentioned this in, in the testimony that we watched that we would be in the back of class arguing or goofing off or laughing and somehow even while he's laughing and goofing off with me he was he was simultaneously paying attention to the lecture and uh because at the end the, the professor would say all right any questions and Nabil would go up and he started asking him questions about things that he had said during the lecture and I was like I did not hear one word that this guy said because I was back here I was back here talking to Nabil so he had weird abilities like that was also uh Nabil could have been a comedian. Um, he didn't. When, when you see him being funny, he is. You haven't seen the half of it, right? The guy, the guy is, the guy is uh, absolutely hilarious. Just off the, off the cuff. We did a, we did an event. We were, no, we were on the speech and debate team in, in school, and so. But there were various events, right? It's not just it's not just one event that you would you would go to. You would normally enter a bunch of different categories. One of the categories was broadcast journalism, right? And the category of broadcast journalism is you walk in there and they hand you a stack of news stories from that day. And you have to act like a broadcast. And it, sometimes they're different. Sometimes it's, it's, it's radio broadcast. So you don't have to be looking at anyone. And other times it would be, no, you have to do it like a television broadcast. So you have to actually be looking at, at, at your judge and stuff like this, just like you're doing a newscast. So you get a stack of stories. And I was not, I was, I was horrible at that. Nabil was absolutely hilarious. So uh, Nabil, uh, I think in that event, I, he got either third or fourth in the nation um, in, in that category when we went to the national tournament uh, because he was so good at it. But he did it, he did it differently from everyone else. Other people gave their pre, you know, did their news, their, their broadcast seriously, like news reporters. Nabil did his um, in a, in like hilarious fashion. And uh, we'll go through too many because we want to wrap this up. But uh, just to give you a couple of examples, he, again, he's doing this off the cuff. He's, he's getting handed news stories and he just goes off the cuff. And uh, so I just remember because I, I thought it was it's probably not that hilarious. It was hilarious to me at the time. But he got this story and it's about, I don't even remember, it was something about a tornado in Wyoming. Uh, so it was something about something happening in Wyoming and stuff, people complaining about something that happened in Wyoming. And he he's reading the story and he, he, as soon as he gets it, he goes, a lot of people are saying blah, 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 blah about Wyoming. I say, why not, Oming? And then he he, uh, he he just started doing plays on words all the way all the way through. And then the very next one he got was about uh, Germany and uh, the church in Germany was complaining because an ice cream company had named its new seven flavors after the seven deadly sins. And Nabil, who was still a Muslim at the time, uh, just rolls with it. He reads a couple lines of the story and he says, um, but I say, let them have their ice cream named after their seven deadly sins. Then they'll all go to hell where their ice cream will melt. And bam, just, just goes on to the next story. But he just, he did that over and over and over again. I would be, uh, I would be uh, trying not to fall on the floor, cracking up as he's just burning through these. Um, but uh, that was, that was the kind of uh, abilities that Nabil had. And uh, uh, that's why, that's why he was able to do so much in, in such a short time. So um, glad that we could have this uh, time together on Nabil's birthday. Um, those of you who haven't read Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, you'll want to do that. Um, you know, by this time, I mean, even if you've just watched his testimony, you know, um, you know, you know his basic story, but it is really a, a great work of, uh, of apologetics. And, uh, so again, if, for those of you who are interested in Islam, which if you're on this channel right here, um, I assume you are. So if you're interested in responding to Muslims, it is good to, uh, understand the Islamic mindset and what the arguments are. And especially the third edition where, um, it's been expanded in various ways. Uh, you want to check that out. So it's an awesome book for that, but also for you Muslims who are watching, um, we saw the massive blunder of, uh, Islamic Dawah here and completely massacring the, context. If you really care about Jesus and you're really interested in the truth about God, um, reading Nabil's book would be, a, would be a good step right there. So Nabil's book is good for everyone, especially people who are interested in Islam. And so, as I mentioned, when, when Mark was on, it would be in my, it would be number one, it would be number one in the category of Islam. But even for, for people who are just interested in uh, general apologetics, who aren't, who don't want to go into much depth 
on Islam. So they don't want to read multiple books. Uh, I think any Christian in general who's just interested in general apologetics, even if they're not, don't want to focus on Islam, I think every Christian needs to learn about Islam because you've got 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. And though many of those Muslims are being trained to like Nabil to go after Christianity. And so very important to understand uh, people who are going to be um, criticizing your ideology. So even if you're, you, you're not interested in focusing on Islam, you might be interested in atheism or something like that. You do need some information on Islam. And so that would be a, be a good book. Good book to uh, to get. All right, thank you everyone for 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 joining us tonight. Uh, it was a cool time, but I've got a family that uh, that's going to need to go to sleep. So we'll see you all next time. Uh, trying to think when I'll be live streaming again. Um, I think I'm getting Tommy Robinson on soon. I'm finally in contact with Tommy. Going to want to get Christian Prince on after that, and uh, be doing a lot of nightly live streams with Sam Shamoon here in the very near future. So. Um, if you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. Got a lot of things coming up and it should be coming out with uh, new videos pretty much every day for a while. All right. So see you all next time. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I know we're all thankful for Nabil right now and uh, just pray for his, pray for his family, um, his Muslim family, that they'll come to the truth and pray for his, uh, his wife and his daughter, Aya. See you all next time.